Welcome everyone to the virtual Riverside Insect Fair. I'd like you guys all for joining us today. Uh, today we have all things pollination panel, and this is with Dr. Hollis Woodard and Jake Sakala, and then Dr. Aaron Rankin and Elijah Hall. Uh, today we'll be covering a various amount of topics in terms of pollination. So if you guys would like, go ahead and take it away. Let's do an introduction as well. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Hollis Woodard and my lab group works on bumblebees. So they're usually generalist pollinators, which means they visit a lot of different flowering plants. Um, they tend to be in areas that are a little bit colder or more alpine. And so we end up working um, in a lot of meadows and high elevation places. And my research group works on uh, bumblebee behavior and physiology. And we work a lot on queen bumblebees, which we're really interested in because when they first start out their nest, they're basically um, kind of like single moms. They have to start their nest on their own and they have to do all the work for the nest on their own until their workers come out in the colony later and then they become a social uh, insect. So we're working on a lot of different questions around that. Hi, um, my name is Jake Sakala. I'm a PhD student in the entomology department at UC Riverside. Um, and I work on various wild or native species of bees in California. So I have a couple of slides here just to show you my background um, with pollinators. So I did my bachelor's degree at Cal Poly Pomona here in Southern California. And in a lab at Cal Poly, I helped study how um, honeybees, which you see here on the bottom left, and also different species of wild bees like this green metallic sweat bee that you see here, contribute to the pollination of watermelon um, at farms around Southern California. And this was really awesome because I got to learn all about these cool insects that I did not know existed. These are bees, but when most people think about, you know, bees, they think about the honeybee here. But there's over 1600 species of bees in California statewide. Um, and they also contribute to pollination of crops. So here at UC Riverside, um, I've focused on studying wild bee communities or like all the different species present um, inside plant nurseries, which we have a lot of these nurseries scattered around the state. They're full of these blooming plants that people buy to plant in their yards or in other urban spaces. But when they're sitting in these habitats, they still attract a wide variety of bees. So for part of my research, um, I went out to these places and just to see like what kinds of bees are these plants attracting, um, you know, because this is important because these places can give these bees pollen and nectar throughout the year. They can help feed them, but there's also pesticides and stuff used in these places that can hurt the bees. So we need to be aware of like what species are out here. Um, so yeah, part of my research was just going out, looking at what types of bees were here, finding all the different species that were there. I also did some cool experiments where I marked these bees. You can see there's four different species of bees here. And I put little dots of paint on their back to keep track of um, individuals through time. So I got to see how they live their like day-to-day -day lives um, inside these nurseries. And then I also did some experiments looking at different ways in which we treat the plants themselves, like how much water you give the plants or when you apply pesticides to the plants, things that would happen in these nurseries. How does that affect the health of bees that use the pollen and nectar from those plants? Um, so yeah, I've worked with a lot of different um, bee species um, in the system answering these cool questions. Um, yeah, it's a thing. <laughs> Um, I'm Erin Rankin, like Hollis. I'm a faculty member at the Department of Entomology here at UC Riverside. And um, what we do in my lab, which Jake gave you a little bit, hopefully you can all see um, my screen here. Is that accurate? Can you see it? Great. Um, so Jake gave a nice introduction of some of the stuff we do in the lab. We're really focused on a community perspective. So what are all the different types of organisms that visit flowers? What are interactions among different species at flowers? And we work on a, a variety of different pollinators, not just bees, um, but also uh, this is the Western yellow jacket, one of our very abundant social wasps here in California. But we also work on a variety of other 
pollinators and sometimes uh, organisms that harass pollinators at flowers, such as ants. Um, but we definitely are also interested in hummingbirds and bees and how do hummingbirds and bees interact at a flower? Do they affect each other's uh, visitation or whether or not a flower is attractive to various species? And I have another graduate student in the lab who's also looking at um, Lepidopteran pollinators, particularly the painted lady um, butterfly, and just other organisms that can interact with butterflies and bees and hummingbirds to affect their, their visitation patterns. So we do a whole lot of different, um, different interactions, just trying to figure out, are they, are they uh, getting nectar from the plants? Are they eating each other? Are these floral resources actually, you know, a nice little market for predators to come and to eat the pollinators? So we look at all different interactions um, at the flower. Thank you all. Um, we do have a few questions that were asked. Oh, should I should I go? Sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry, Elijah. <laughs> yes, please go ahead. Sorry, I'm a little slow here. So my name is Elijah Hall. Um, I'm a PhD student at, in Nicole Rafferty's lab at UC Riverside, and I'm in the ecology, evolution, and organismal biology department. And this is what it looks like if you're a bee, and I'm, I'm getting ready to catch you here. Um, so I'm an ecologist, um, which means that I study how living things in interact with one another. And in particular, um, which is why I'm here, is I'm, I study pollination ecology, which is um, the study of how pollinators like insects uh, interact with um, plants, especially flowers, um, through time and space. Um, so I, yeah, wasn't sure how comp or how how much information to put in this. So I'm just going to skip some slides. But I study um, plants and pollinators at the community level, um, which means that uh, whatever bees and, and pollinators are out in nature, I try to. I try to catch them and study them as well as the um, community of, of plants that flower in nature as well. Um, and let me just skip this. And in particular, I study um, climate change and pollination. So um, as, you, as you may know, climate change is increasing temperatures and decreasing rainfall in Southern California. Um, and these changes in temperature and rainfall can impact plants and pollinators phenology which is the seasonal timing of biological events. So for example, if you think about um, uh, flowers that only bloom in the spring, that's their phenology. They're, they're evolved to, to flower at specific times and pollinators are evolved to be active at certain times of the year as well. Um, so that's what I study. And if we look at um, uh, these interactions here at a community level, um, if climate change is, is impacting the timing of, of uh, plants and pollinators phenology that can impact these networks. So for example, if the, the flower that was over here on the right is no longer available at a certain time of year, then this bee over here um, changes from a happy bee that used to have plenty of flowers to visit to a grumpy bee that doesn't have any flowers to visit and, and can't make uh, and can't gather any food. And, and what that results in is uh, bees that aren't able to um, have enough food to, to give to their babies and, and flowers that don't make very many seeds. Um, so I'm particularly interested in how climate change is impacting plants and pollinators and their interactions and what that means for their reproduction um, of plants and pollinators. So in, in making seeds and, and baby pollinators. Um, so just a, a day in the life. Uh, as an ecologist, I spend a lot of time outdoors uh, collecting pollinators. Today, I'm, I'm actually in Palm Desert out in the Coachella Valley, um, collecting pollinators. And um, what I do pretty much while I'm out uh, collecting is uh, stare, spend a lot of time staring at flowers, looking for pollinators of all shapes and sizes. Um, so these are kind of some examples of, of some plants that I've been seeing in the past couple of days, different cacti, and, and they can be big plants or really tiny plants, um, and also different kinds of pollinators. 
um, from, from all over the elevational range that's in Southern California. So meaning from um, like uh, Palm Desert in, in the valley all the way up to San Jacinto Mountain is where I work. So the picture on the left here is up in the Jeffrey Pine Forest. Um, and then I take those pollinators and the information and I, I pin them and I identify the pollinators and spend a lot of time on my computer um, doing different kinds of statistical analyses to, to kind of learn about um, the interactions between, between plants and pollinators. So that's, that's what I've got today and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Elijah. I appreciate that. That was really wonderful to see all the things that you have done in all of your studies. Um, we did receive a few questions here. Um, let me go ahead and see. Um, our first question is, how do you catch a bee, mark it, and find it again in the future? And I know a few of you guys have been um, as well studying uh, bees, of course. So. Uh, I might take that one because I showed the picture. Let me show that picture again. Um, so yeah, this was part of a study that I did inside of plant nurseries around Southern California. So I was curious, like, what are these bees doing day to day? Are they sort of just popping in these nurseries for one day and then leaving and never coming back? Or are they actually living their lives in there day to day? So this little contraption that you see here is called a queen marking cage. And it's actually used by um, honey people that keep honeybees or beekeepers to mark the queen bee, because she's very important, right? Um, she kind of is in charge of the whole hive and you need to keep an eye on her. So beekeepers will usually stick her in this little chamber here. And this is a foam plunger that you can push her back up against this mesh, which you can't really see here. Um, but then you can take a marker or something and then just dab it on the back of her thorax. Um, so you have this colorful, colorful mark on the queen and you can keep track of her more easily. Um, well, this technique can also be used with different species of bees. Now, these bees don't live in colonies. They don't have queens like honeybees do, um, but you can still mark them and track them over time. So I would just go out, look at the flowers, mark as many bees that I could within a set time period, and then come back on another day and look in the same area and surrounding areas and just try to see like how many I could find. Um, and I actually recovered about 50% of them after a 24 hour period, which I was really shocked by that because these things are really small. Like this is a fairly large bee. This is a carpenter bee, um, which is native to California. But then this little bee right here is super tiny. Um, but overall, I found about half of these bees again after 24 hours. So this study that I did showed that they had really like high fidelity um to these sites and patches of flowers that they were on in these nurseries which was really cool thank you jake that was really interesting yeah, I, was we, have an, <laughs> we have another question for you as well um this is something that you had mentioned during your presentation uh what chemicals or pesticides do you recommend to not hurt bees um if somebody wants to garden uh, yeah, that's a tough question. And if other people want to chime in on this one, um, they can. But yeah, it's it's a uh, it's hard to recommend because a lot of pesticides, you know, a lot of insecticides are broad spectrum, so they will harm all insects kind of indiscriminately. So I really only work with neonicotinoids. I can't really comment too much on other classes of pesticides, but I've worked a lot with neonics, um, as they're called for short which people can apply to plants um, and they're systemic, which means that they will eventually go into all parts of the plant, um, even the pollen and the nectar that the bees consume. So um, people have been studying neonics as one of the possible causes of declines that we're seeing in bee populations. Um, there's a lot of research that goes into that. Um, it's really complicated. Um, but yeah, that's the class of pesticides that I focus on. So generally, if you're going to buy plants from nurseries or garden centers that you are using specifically to support insects, beneficial insects, like bees, you want to look for plants that are grown without um, neonicotinoids because those can be harmful to insects that are consuming the pollen and nectar of these plants. Thank you, Jake. 
Thank you. So in this case, you would recommend more of the organic seeds um, or produced uh, flowers. Or um, yeah, I mean, no pesticides is the best option. Yeah. Perfect. And then to go along with um, the first question that was asked, um, in order to be able to track the bees, did you need to mark each bee a different color or was it, you know, you just had one unified color for the specific species? So the different colors were actually used to, yeah, I didn't mention this, were used to track the um, species of plant that I caught the bee on. So at each of my sites, I had a different color corresponding to each um, plant species that off which the bee was caught. So I could keep track like, oh, I found this bee yesterday on this species of plant. Um, and for the most part, they like stayed on the same plants too. So they stayed in the same place and they were foraging on the same types of flowers day to day um, is what I found. So that was really cool. Thank you. Um, a few years ago, I know this has been brought up um, in terms of, you know, bees possibly being endangered. You know, is that something that is still happening? Is this true? And then, um, you know, what is the reasoning for bees to die off? Because I know that that was a conversation that Elijah had brought up in terms of if bees don't have a certain flower that may have um, been produced early enough within the season, then, you know, that they're not able to go ahead and feed their own. Uh, so can you guys go ahead and expand on that? Sure. I think we can each kind of add to this. Um, bees are basically being affected by many different stressors and it's all kind of like a perfect storm that's going on. So one thing we look at in, in our lab is our pathogens and predators of bees. So if a new pathogen spreads through an area that can affect bee populations. If you get an invasive predator like um, an invasive hornet, for example, that, that um, consumes uh, bees. Uh, that can be very stressful to uh, a population. And if you're already under stress, and maybe Elijah could talk to this, but if you're already under stress due to climate stressors, then that additional addition of predators and pathogens can just uh, amplify the negative impact on our bees. Yeah, that's right. Uh, just in, increases in temperatures are more stressful to pollinators and, and bees especially, and, and also to um, plants if you think about the, the plant side of it as well. Um, so yeah, uh, increases in, in temperature and, and decreases in rainfall are definitely one of the mechanisms that um, are causing um, native bees at least to, to um, decrease in populations in population size. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to speak to the other ways that uh, are other things that are harming uh, pollinators, but um, other things that people are, are researchers are thinking about are changes um, to habitat or habitat loss um, and, and the loss of natural uh, native plants. So that's one of the ways that you can really help um, pollinators in, in your backyard or, or by uh, planting native plants that are well watered and, and produce a bunch of flowers. Um, yeah. Thank um, you. Just, oh, I was just going to agree with Aaron and Elijah. I think those are both great points. Um, you know, they, I think they hit all the high notes. I would say, you know, it's human behavior and human activity that's driving the decline of pollinators ultimately. You know, it's converting our landscapes into places that are just not sustainable um, for pollinators. And then on top of that, or in addition to that, cranking up the temperature and changing weather patterns. And so all of that together is hum caused by people and is leading to pollinator declines. And so, um, you know, it's people changing their behavior and fundamentally how we live, that, that that's gonna have to happen if we wanna try to protect our pollinators. Thank you all for that. Um, it, and again, in terms of us being able to go ahead and help our bee community, um, are there specific flowers that are better for pollinating insects um, just in general?
I think a lot of us study the communities of bees. So there's lots of different bees that will go to the same type of, of flower. Um, here in California, in the California Floristic Province, we have an amazing diversity of native floral vegetation. And um, there are, it supports a lot of um, a lot of visitors and not just, you know, things coming to the flower, but also things that are going to um, eat the leaves. And then that also is, a, is the prey base for other organisms, whether they're predatory wasps or if they're birds. So if you, if you, we can make sure that we are um, promoting our native vegetation, that kind of gives our kind of the base of our, our complete California food web. So native plants often are a lot less maintenance um, than trying to, to plant something that, that isn't from this area, just because they evolved with some of our, our wonderful um, low water uh, situations. Um, but we do have a lot of things that flower and promote and support our pollinators that are really good for our, that live well in our soils and can handle the 115 degrees that we sometimes get here in Riverside in August, um, for example. So you can plant native plants is one thing. And then I don't know if, if anyone else wants to talk to um, the second thing that bees need, which is nesting habitat. Um, Jake, did you want to talk about that? You've done some work with nesting blocks. Yeah, sure. So. Um... Like we've said, we have this huge diversity of different species of bees in the state, um, and they have very different requirements for how they live. Um, so part of that is where they make their nests. So you probably are familiar with honeybees. They live in these giant hives that they mostly construct themselves in like crevices. So, you know, we've all seen like those honeycombs um, inside trees or in holes in the ground. Um, but a lot of bees um, live in the ground. Most species of bees in California make their nests in the soil. Um, and a lot of these species are solitary, so they don't live in giant hives like we've mentioned. Um, so leaving a lot of bare soil um, is usually recommended when you're trying to support a diverse community of bees because so many different species um, you know, nest in the soil. But then there's also a huge group of bees that make their nests in above ground cavities, um, which I think Elijah mentioned earlier, like some nest in crevices in wood. Um, some of them excavate their own uh, tunnels in wood, like those carpenter bees that I showed you. They actually bore holes into wood themselves with their giant mandibles. Other bees will actually like rent tunnels. They'll look for pre-existing tunnels um, and lay their eggs and stuff in there. Um, and others will nest inside like um, hollow reeds or stems of plants that are dried out. So, so it's also good to leave things like that around um, in the landscape if you want to support those bee species that nest that way. And then um, a lot of the bee species that nest inside cavities, the one I just ones I just mentioned, they additionally need materials to make their nests inside there. So they don't just go in there and lay an egg and leave a lot of species will construct nests um, using different materials to protect their eggs. So um, those bees in the last slide I showed you on those pretty purple flowers, those are leaf cutter bees. And they're called that because the female, the adult female, when she's laying eggs in her tunnel, she'll, she'll actually clip pieces of leaves from um, plants in the environment. And she'll sort of wallpaper the inside of those tunnels um, with bits of leaves. So she needs those resources to make her nests um, in addition to the pollen and nectar that she's eating and leaving for her babies. So yeah, leaving things like that in the environment um, are important to support reproduction of a lot of different bee species. Uh, we received another question um, here. Um, the question is asking, are there specific flowers that are better to help all pollinating insects? Uh, sorry, that was the question we just answered. Um, but as having more flowering plants, do they help um, pollinate specific uh, plants? So for instance, if I have a tomato plant or I have a citrus tree such as orange or lemon, 
Is there specific plants that you would suggest us planting along with those to help with the pollination? But basically, if you want to promote pollination of your your crops, maybe it's your maybe it's your tomatoes or your peppers, you want to make sure you have bees there before you need them. So having plants that are going to flower before your crop of interest so that you're attracting bees to your yard and they're happy and they're healthy and then they'll be there to help visit your flowers of of whatever your your uh, plant of interest is. Citrus is a is an interesting one because everything loves citrus. Bees love citrus. Flies, which are also important pollinators, but totally understudied. Um, and hummingbirds even like citrus, but we don't always want them to visit our citrus. So it really depends on which citrus you're talking about. Because sometimes if you have too much bee pollination, you'll have too many seeds. And we don't want that for some citrus, but other ones we, like if you're gonna juice it or something, it doesn't matter as much about the seeds. Um, but if you wanna bring them in for your peppers, for example, definitely you want to attract or your peas, you want to attract the bees before your um, your crop flowers. Thank you for that, Erin. We received another question, and the question is, what made you guys inspired to study bees? Um, well, I became interested in bees because I worked on their social behavior and most bees actually aren't social. They live on their own. Um, but, uh, you know, some of them are social and they live in complicated societies. Um, so I started working on them from the, the perspective that we need to understand more about their social biology. So that's how I became interested. Um, at first, and then um, now I'm in more interested even in conservation because so many of the bumblebees are declining. And I think also we forget they have personalities as well. When you study them in a, you know, in a, in a more controlled environment, particularly like if it is a social colony, you get to know them, especially if you mark them. You know that, you know, the one with the the double red spot on the thorax, she's really quick at foraging. She has a really short return time when some have idiosyncrat idiosyncratic behaviors. Um, they become very endearing when you study them and also um, they're, they're cute. I was um, mostly, so I, I guess I have a different reason to be interested in them but I studied or was studying like plants in in college and um, learned a lot about the importance of pollination to plant reproduction and, and reproductive success and that kind of got me into the uh, yeah into the research uh, about uh, plants and pollinators and thinking about them from the plant perspective and, and from the pollinator perspective so I think that's really interesting and the importance of pollination to to ecosystems and, and to plants in general, I think are really important. So that's what's kept me interested in, in this kind of science. Um, yeah, for me, I sort of touched on it in my first slide, but like that first day that I went out as an undergrad to a farm and I saw these like little flying green gems visiting the flowers, it just blew my mind. I was like, these little creatures exist <laughs> and they like pollinate our food for us. Like, that's so cool. I didn't even know they existed. Um, so for me, um, I just love going out and discovering like the diversity of bees that are in a habitat. Um, Cause each one is so unique and they all, they each have their own story to tell. Um, and yeah, I just want to learn more about them so we can protect them better. <laughs> And they have communication systems. Um, they can leave little footprints uh, incidentally as they walk on a flower. And then the next bee that comes, uh, bumblebees are particularly good at this. They can detect that and be like, whoa, someone was just here. I shouldn't eat at this flower. Um, and then if you get a stingless bees, they eavesdrop on each other all the time, uh, detecting chemical signals. 
um, to make foraging decisions. So they're also quite smart. I mean, you don't wanna try to feed on a flower that just got emptied by another bee. So understanding how they communicate and particularly how important scent is, is also just from a biological perspective, it is really fascinating. Thank you all for this. Uh, on Facebook, we received another question and it is, are there local nocturnal pollinators? Um, we had somebody else also reference, they have a dragon fruit tree in their backyard and they have something similar to this that happens um, where their fruit blooms at night. Um, is this something that is common and what other nocturnal pollinators are there? Um, I can talk a little bit about this. My I don't study nocturnal pollinators, but one of my lab mates does, so I um, know a little bit about it. So there are um, hundreds, if not thousands, of species of nocturnal pollinators in California, um, and they are mostly, in terms of uh, diversity, moths. So uh, moths are, are related, well, uh, butterflies are actually a type of moth. Um, and moths are really, really important to nocturnal pollination, especially in the deserts, um, like where where we are in Southern California, because like the like the example of of the plant that only blooms during the night, um, a lot of species use that as a way to reduce water loss because it's so hot during the day. They close their flowers and only open them at night, um, and it's uh, the responsibility of moths and, and other nocturnal pollinators, you might think of like bats are, are kind of a charismatic nocturnal pollinator. Um, and they're they're all over um, the world really, and, and especially Southern California, there are there's a huge diversity of them. If you just turn on a light in your backyard at night or put up like a white sheet and, and point a light at it at night, um, you'll, you'll see that there are just thousands of moths at some points and they can be all different shapes and sizes from almost microscopic uh, to like, like half a centimeter to to maybe like 10 centimeters in size some of the sphinx moths so um, yeah nocturnal pollinators are really cool and, and really useful in our environments Thank you, Elijah, for that. I do notice there is a lot of moss in my backyard as well. I'm not sure though if it's because I have a water resource or I also just have a lot of herbs. Um, but uh, we have another question here and it's how can I support bees and other pollinators in my own backyard? I know a few of you guys have already previously mentioned, um, you know, having flowers or other plants, but is there anything else that we can do to also support them? I mean, nesting uh, habitat, food um, in the form of, of uh, nectar and pollen is important. Um, sometimes in August, a lot of them need some water as well. So bird baths are a great place to watch, um, watch bees coming in. Usually in the morning, they'll grab a little bit of water and then go back. Um, Honeybees, for example, will use that water to help regulate the temperature of the hive. Um, as will a lot of our social wasps, kind of creating like a little swamp cooler inside the nest. Um, and then for some of the bees that Jake was talking about, they need that water to mix with dirt um, to make mud to line their cells or um, um, others will need to mix it with uh, um, with the uh, leaf clippings or what have you to, to really line those cells nicely for, for nesting. So really ne having nectar sources all year round is really important. Thank you for that. Uh, that was, it's funny because someone just asked, um, do bees drink water? So you went ahead and you had to answer that. So that is a yes. Um, at this time, if you guys are joining us, um, you guys can go ahead and type into the comments any questions or concerns you guys have about pollinators um, here on the Facebook Live, and then that way we can have uh, UCR answer those questions. Do you guys have anything else that you guys would like to add as well while we're waiting for people to ask anything? 
Um, one thing that you can do to help uh, pollinators as well is by getting your neighbors and friends to plant native plants. Um, in addition to like your own backyard, the, the more resources that are available for native pollinators, the better. So um, yeah, uh, trying to, to get as many flowers as possible is a good idea. I was going to say to getting involved in the political process to um, to try to advance agendas that fight against climate change is especially important and um, you know any form of activism but um, getting involved in fighting against that is probably one of the most important things that people can do and it might not be one of the first things that you think of because I think folks want you know easier solutions like planting flowers and stuff like that and those things are important but it's also important to try to address the key drivers um, of their decline. And there's also things that we can promote to um, that's that's a little bit more at the managerial scale. Like if something is flowering, don't mow it. Um, if you have a flowering bush, don't trim it. Um, what we see these things in the medians and on the sides of our highways, when we have wildflowers, we really should stop mowing just for a little bit so that they can use those flowers and then when the flowers are spent, um, we can mow things and, and trim things. Um, but it's really important if we have the flowers, we should try to, to, to keep them. And that also saves some labor costs too. If you are only mowing uh, every so often instead of all the time, and it also gives us something prettier to look at on the freeway while we're driving by. I love that. I think that's definitely something um, that, you know, that, that we can always keep in mind. Um, we have a question here. How do pollinators locate flowers? Um, they use a set of different cues from farther away. Um, they use uh, visual, well, at different scales, they use visual cues. So um, bees, as one example, can't see red. Um, they, they don't see the color red. Um, so, and instead their visual spectrum is shifted and they can see UV, whereas we can't. So um, they often, um, kind of hone in on flowers from visual cues that are of the colors that they can detect. And then also um, odor cues as well are very important. So they can smell flowers um, depending on the flower. Um, some of them they can smell from farther away. And so they can hone in on them that way. So they use some other cues, but those are the main, the main two that they use to find flowers. And nocturnal pollinators are going to be more attracted to the, the lighter colors, things that are going to kind of reflect in the moonlight. So we tend to see a lot of our nocturnal blooming flowers are kind of whitish, or at least that's how they appear to moths. And so, um, yeah, they'll they'll use that as well as their definitely their their sense of sense of smell. And different insects prefer uh, different pollinators prefer different colors. Um, Bumblebees, for example, will have a different innate color preference than, let's say, a butterfly. Um, a lot of butterflies really like orange. A lot of bumblebees like purple. Not to say they don't go to other things, but they have like this, you know, really strong preference innately for colors until they until they learn. All righty. Is the bumblebee a specific breed of native bees? Um, bumblebees are found around the world. So um, we have some species that are native to here. So there are about 50 in North America that are native to here. Um, but there are a very different set of species that are native to Europe, for example. And it's one of our three major groups um, you know, on a worldwide scale of social bees. So we have our honey bees and there are several species of those worldwide. Um, and then we have the bumblebees that Hollis talked about. And in South America, they have uh, stingless bees. Uh, but we, do, we do not have those in California though. 
Well, at this time, we have received no more questions, and I just would like to, you know, extend a thank you to all of you guys for taking the time and the effort to um, partake during the virtual Riverside Insect Fair, and then in addition to our community. So thank you all.